5,000 subscribers. Yay! I hardly know what to say. When I started this channel, my like dream goal was to have 5,000 subscribers by the end of 2024. I thought this would really be kind of a niche channel and that would be kind of a stretch. So I'm very happy and surprised that I'm already at this point. I'm so thankful for you all for being here because I really get the sense that you are my people. I love reading your comments. I love responding to your comments whenever possible. For those of you who've joined my Discord server, I've been having such a fun time there. It's just been everything that I had hoped for when I started this channel, honestly. I don't think that very many people start watching with the 5,000 video Q&A video, but just in case, I'm Lydia Foxglove. I am a fantasy author. I've been both traditionally and indie published, and I've been mostly full-time since 2009. I asked for questions from YouTube on the community tab, and you guys gave me a very nice little list. I'm going to try to get through all of them. We'll see how well I do, especially because my microphone is running out of batteries and I have dinner with the family tonight, but let's see how far I can get. I also finished The Broken Queen last night. Basically, I started with the revisions. I mean, I've been working on the revisions for a while, but I was at the final stretch and I started at 9 a.m. and I was done at 2 a.m. I had two quick meals and a nap and the rest was all writing. So yesterday was very exhausting and I'm so relieved to be done with that. I will be starting to send it out to reviewers and I'm gonna bump up the release date to mid-May and it's all very exciting. And I'm gonna have a video about the whole process of outlining and writing that next week. But let's get to the questions. How do you deal with the uncertainty of your career? As in your salary is never fixed, you're responsible for your own hours and marketing, you never know what's gonna happen. Um, the short answer is that whenever I have a good year, I save as much as possible. <laughs> That's where my ring light just kinda like bleh. But uh, yeah, if it was like overly uncertain for too many years, I would probably just find a different line of work eventually. <laughs> but it's so far worked out. And from the same person, another thing that interests me is if commercializing your writing ever takes the joy out of it, do you ever find yourself writing in a way the public will, uh, will like rather than the way you enjoy most? Um, it's a mix. It does take some of the joy out of it, which is one reason that I'm really hoping that I can write what I truly love this year and that this YouTube channel will kind of help with that. But I'm also not really capable of writing things that I dislike. If I was, maybe I could write more commercially than I do, but there's always a decent amount of me in it. Are the books you mostly read in the genre you write? The usual commandment for writers is to read a lot of books to build an intuition on what readers would want. Um, no, I'm terrible about that. Again, I'd probably be more successful if I was better at reading what I write. <laughs> but I love to read everything. Nonfiction's actually my favorite thing to read. I read very widely with nonfiction and I also read very widely with fiction really about the only sections of the library that I never hit is I don't really care about mysteries. Don't hate me, I've tried. I just don't care about the mystery part, which is too bad because mysteries often have very cute settings and characters. I just can't get interested in the mystery. I look at the 40 books in four years video and wonder how do you deal with creative fatigue and burnout? How do you relax when your work is creative? Mm. I have not always dealt with it very well in the past. Eventually it will catch up with you. And I've really been trying to set aside time to refill the well and do the things that I care about the most. Like since I just finished The Broken Queen, I am kind of forcing myself to take a week off and just read books and play JRPGs and don't work too hard. I'm doing these YouTube videos, but I'm not gonna write and I'm not gonna go hard on anything else. It can be hard though, I'm not gonna lie. Okay, and then Erica asked if I could talk about how to get into world building and writing for those of us who stop doing these things and feel a bit stuck. And also if I could talk more about manifesting. Since this comment was made, I made a whole video about manifesting. And the other topic is probably something to address in a whole other video as well, honestly. It's kind of a lot and is probably something that will come up in various videos in various ways, truthfully. I'm curious about how people who talk about the writing process on YouTube translate views into book sales. It seems to me the would-be writers who follow such channels aren't the most likely to buy the author's books. Um, I have been selling books 
thanks to this YouTube channel. I mean, I'm not like getting rich off of it, but I've definitely seen sales bumps, especially in a video that happens to mention any particular book. I see the biggest sales bumps. I mean, I think you have to remember that every writer is a reader. You really don't meet a lot of people who love to write and don't read a lot as well. So I don't think it's the worst audience. There's also a lot of aspiring writers who are probably reading more than they write. But obviously, I mean, this is not gonna be a substitute for like a targeted ad campaign to launch a book. At this point in my career, I'm thinking more long game. This is also another reason why some of my videos deal with broader topics, whether it's like just life in general or world building or book recommendations, because I was thinking like what would get people to watch that aren't just strictly like I want writing craft advice, which is be kind of a relaxing channel for anybody that loves writing or reading or fantasy. So far it seems to be working like as well as I expected at least. What is your favorite thing to write and read outside the genre you normally write and read in? Definitely like nonfiction, especially sociology and social history. And I also love like semi-autobiographical novels, especially there were a lot of novels written from like the 20s to the 40s that just have like a nice accessible but somewhat literary prose style and are very cozy and relaxing like Ella Montgomery and Laura Ingalls Wilder and the Betsy Tacey books and A Tree Grows in Brooklyn and you know, there's a lot. Where do we buy your books at? you can find them most places because most of my books are distributed widely. If you're having any trouble finding a particular one, there's a few weird search engine issues with certain ones. So just like, let me know in the comments if you can't find one somewhere. Do you have a website? Mm, not really. <laughs> I have a very old out of date website, but mostly like social media has kind of replaced websites. I also, I'm just terrible at making websites. Which book is your favorite of your books? Either Doll Girl Meets Dead Guy or The Cursed Soul Trilogy. Which book is the best to start with? I would say the same ones I just mentioned because they're my favorites and they're the ones set in my like true fantasy world. But you know, you could also start with whatever one just happens to grab your tastes. There aren't very many that I really didn't like at all. Actually, I, I wouldn't say there's any that I didn't like at all, but there are some that I think are better than others, but I really try not to write things that I don't like at all. How do you get through edits? How do you know when it's edited enough? That's a whole video topic. How do you like the mountains, living in the mountains? I love the mountains. I grew up in Florida and we would pretty much always go to the mountains on a vacation pretty regularly, like usually once a year to some mountains or other, or at least hills. And then when I hit adulthood and I no longer went on family vacations and I was really broke and I didn't see the mountains for like several years. And at one point I just started thinking of the mountains while I was standing in the lingerie department of Sears, which was where I worked. And I just started crying because I wanted to see mountains so badly. And basically from that point on, I was determined to get out of Florida and move to the mountains. And I'm probably never leaving the mountains again. I do have to say I like the Maryland mountains better than the North Carolina mountains though. The Maryland mountains have like broad valleys between the mountains. The North Carolina mountains are a little more aggressive. And like, if you enjoy the road, just kind of tumbling down the hill and taking a month to repair, then you'll love Western North Carolina. I wonder how you keep your passion for your own personal stories and storytelling in general. I struggle with thinking mine aren't good and cringy and therefore I shouldn't even bother writing. <laughs> this isn't something that I, that I really struggle with on an inherent level. I struggle more with not being able to write than keeping my passion for it. But it is a whole other question of whether I sometimes think my stories are cringy and bad and the difficulties of putting them out into the world for critique and criticism. That's kind of a different topic. The burning desire to tell stories has never left me. So if you're struggling with that part of it, I'm probably not the best person to advise you, but when it comes to how do you get them out there when you feel like they're not good. I will say that never goes away. So you just kind of have to at some point accept that if you want to do this, you have to just learn to live with it. What brings you joy in life? The greatest joy for me is getting into the zone with a book and I can't control that really. And it sometimes doesn't happen for quite a while, but that is the thing that probably brings me the most, just like rush of happiness and I'm lost in it. It's almost kind of torturous in a way though, because it's very addictive. It's almost 
drug-like to be in the zone. But as far as things that I can actually access and control, I remember being at a writer friend's house once and she made me this really wonderful cup of tea. It was a poor tea. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but it was this tea that smelled kind of like an old wood smoky house and it was really delicious. And I was so enjoying this cup of tea and like talking about how it smelled and tasted. I was just getting really into this tea. And she said, that's what I like about hanging out with other writers. I think that we get more excited about little things than the average person. I don't know if that's true, but it's definitely true for me. I am very easy to make happy, honestly. I like tea and hot cocoa and books and cats and video games and going thrifting with a friend and having a nice little lunch and having a good conversation with somebody. And I don't really wish for a whole lot more. Do you prefer self-publishing? Do you think the traditional publishing route was worth the squeeze for you? I don't regret traditional publishing at all, but I also do prefer self-publishing, particularly at this point in the market. When I started, self-publishing was not what it is today and it would not have been a good option for what I was writing. If I was a little younger and I had started in this environment, I might have skipped right to self-publishing, but I, you know, I have mixed thoughts about it. I have a video about this coming up. The short answer is I, yeah, that's the short answer. Do you regret not going to college or any type of training in today's day and age? The reason I'm asking that is because in recent times you almost need a college degree or some sort of certification so an author can have health insurance and a livable wage until they have the privilege to quit their jobs. I know you and your sisters have done well without college. I'm just curious because in recent times it's too risky to become an author without some sort of savings or living with family or a partner. Um, it is risky and no, I don't regret it. I've tried to always set my life up so that I'm living very cheaply so that at any time I could get a job almost anywhere and I would be able to cover the bills in a baseline kind of way. Health insurance can now be gone through the ACA, so hooray for that, that helps a lot. But college is also very expensive and a lot of artists that I know are very burdened by their student loans. Whereas if you are living very cheaply, you have a ton of freedom in that regard. If you can always get by just working a retail job, you have a lot of freedom because you will always know that you can get a retail job or maybe like a basic stay at home job and you don't have to really strive for a big career. But obviously that's risky because at some point you're gonna wanna make more money or you're not gonna have much of anything. For me, it's worked out and I don't really know for sure how much of that is luck or privilege. All I can say is that for me personally, I'm in a pretty good position now. Do you write a bunch of genres and different age demographics? Mm, somewhat. I've written YA to adult, but there's a lot of crossover audience between those two. And everything I've written has like a fantasy element. I'm really bad at writing without a fantasy element, but it's ranged widely within the sense of having a fantasy element. How often do you do a book tour to promote your novels? Never. <laughs> Equipment you use for YouTube. I just have an iPhone and I have these Rode wireless go-to microphones and a ring light and then a couple little pieces of like, you know, little stands and things to move around the iPhone. I could upgrade to a camera at some point, but I wanted to keep it really simple. I just wanted to make it as accessible for myself as possible because this was all new to me and I'm also not like trying to be a cinematographer or something. So the iPhone may just suffice for the type of videos that I do. What order of things do you go through when generating a new novel? What can spark the new idea? Do you develop characters or plot first? And how do you decide on plot points during this process? That's probably gonna have to be a whole video. I'm gonna talk, like I said, about The Broken Queen next week. And every novel's a little different in that regard. So probably every time I finish one, I'm gonna talk about how that particular one shook out. And you know, that's probably gonna come up. What percentage of your income do you spend on marketing? It usually ends up being about 30%, but it can vary based on some different factors. Any advice for spiraling to thinking your work will never get checked out or a way to make sure you're doing all you can to get eyes on your work? I mean, this, this can be difficult. I've certainly felt that spiral before. I know this is kind of similar to that other question. As far as doing all you can, when you're in the early stages, critique partners really are wonderful to have. Not all of your critique partners will be good. And over time, you'll start to get a sense of which ones are actually helping you versus giving you kind of bad advice. In the early stages, I had many critique partners. It really helped me 
Not only did their advice help me, but critiquing their work helped me to see why my work needed to be fixed and in what ways. And you'll get to a point where you'll start to have some critique partners that are genuinely excited to read the next chapter or whatever, and that's when you kind of start to know, like, I'm getting kind of good at this. Tips for completing a book. I finished one, but sometimes get close to finishing and then just think the idea isn't it. Not sure if others struggle with this, but I was impressed with how many books you have seen to the end. Um, one thing that I've really learned over time is you are always going to think that the book could have been more and it could have been better. So just finish it and don't get too hung up on that. I mean, there's a difference between like your book may need editing to make it better and just like not even doing it whatsoever. A, books can change, like just finish it and then you can get feedback or you can set it aside and let it like percolate in your mind. But I've never released a book that I didn't have some sense of like, hmm, I don't know about this part. I don't know if the ending was the best. I think I could have developed this character a little more. I wonder if the pacing is too slow. Maybe I need to do another pass to describe things. At some point, I just have to cut myself off and say, you're done, you're done. Do you still play video games? Yes. I wish I had more time for them, but I love playing video games and I'm going to play some video games this week. I'm trying to decide whether I should get back to work on the Star Ocean Second Story remake or whether I should get back on my replay of Final Fantasy VI or one of my friends was telling me how good Final Fantasy VIII is and I've never played it, which is which is kind of shocking. I'm also kind of in the middle of Dragon Quest V and uh, there's also about like 50 other games on my shelf. But yeah, mostly JRPGs are my, my jam. Any advice about how to keep new characters distinct from past personalities even when there is archetype overlap? I just don't worry about this too much. I think that once you've created a character that readers like once that they don't really mind if they get the same character in a different story. <laughs> with a different name. Sometimes if I feel like they need something, I'll think about their background and try to consider like, is there something I can change about their past, like where they came from or what their job is or some kind of major-ish detail that just gives them a bit of a different flavor. But sometimes characters just seem similar and I, at this point, I don't worry about it that much, especially if you've written as many books as I have, like you're gonna have overlap. As an author, how do you deal with market trends that are hot right now, but you don't think they'll last long? I.e. if readers start gobbling up fantasy apothecary romance, would you try to fold that idea and trope into your existing series? Take a break from what you're currently working on to quickly write a one-off book for fun and variety. Sorry, the cats are getting noisy playing again. Start a new series focused on the trend and pray you can get at least a duet out before readers move on or ignore it altogether and stick to the original plan. I have probably done all of the above depending on the circumstance, like whether I feel like I need a break, how excited I am about the trend, whether I have an idea burning inside me for the trend that I think I just really wanna write this and I wanna get, get it out there while it's hot how much in the middle of a project I am. There's a lot of factors. So um, yeah, all of the above, depending. That actually might not be the worst topic for a video at some point either. Do you have tips for people who are trying to get their first book published with an agent? Also some tips on coming up with different obstacles for characters to face. Um, I'm gonna assume you mean trying to get an agent, not that you already have one, since at that point the agent would be the one figuring out how to get your book published. Agents usually have a fairly high standard, so I would just do everything possible to really study the craft. Again, having critique partners and reading craft books and rewriting and really working on your line edits, increasing tension and good first chapters, and of course the query letter, or all the things that are going to attract an agent's attention. And I actually think those are all really good things to do. The thing about traditional publishing that I really appreciate is that I really worked so hard on making my craft good. It took me three years of like really focusing on craft before I got an agent. And once you put in that work, like you are gonna carry it with you forever, no matter what you do. Even making a YouTube video, I'm thinking about like the hook and the presentation and the story that I'm telling in the video. And all of those are skills that I first honed by trying to attract an agent's attention. Essentially, you, my YouTube audience, are now kind of like an agent that I'm trying to attract. And as for tips on obstacles for characters to face, uh, I, 
I feel like I'm pretty bad at coming up with obstacles for characters to face. The best ones for me are ones that kind of come from the character's background up until this point. But if you're really having trouble with what to throw at your characters, then I would just try to grab some ideas from stories that you like. Why did you decide to use a pen name for your self-published books? Any tips for picking a pen name? I used a pen name because I started writing young adult and then when I knew I was moving into more of an adult romance space, I didn't want, even though my YA name was kind of dying off, I didn't want kids who were reading those books to then be like, what else has she written? And then find like a dark romance or something. So that's kind of an obvious reason to have a pen name. As far as how to choose a pen name, well, as a kid, I had like various aliases I would use in my stories sometimes, and Lydia was one of those. So I knew that like mentally it would be very easy to answer to. And the foxglove part to me, I just thought like sounded kind of cool, maybe vaguely sexy and kind of has an association with fairy lore. So that would be good for like fantasy and fairy tales. My pen name is a little unconventional, though like most people pick ones that are very easy to spell and remember. But for me, the first priority was that I liked the name and that if somebody said, hey, Lydia, I'd be like, yeah, immediately and not be like, who the heck is that? All right, and I th it looks like that is all the questions. A lot of them are really good questions and I'll probably be going into more depth about many of them in future videos. So just a good reason to stick around and see what comes next here. Hey, Editing Lydia here. Real fast, I forgot to include the giveaway that I'm gonna do for 5,000 subscribers. I'm gonna give away a paperback of Demons in the Bedroom, which is one of my most popular paranormal romance novels. And this is Doll Girl Meets Dead Guy, but I briefly tried rebranding it as A Taste of Magic, and I have an extra one of these still around. So we'll get both of these and it's open internationally. And if you wanna enter, just drop a comment with your favorite book of all time and I will pick a winner when I do my next video, probably Saturday evening. So also make sure to look at comments or watch the next video to see if you're the winner. Thanks for entering and thanks for being here. I hope that all of your creative endeavors are going well and I'm not sure when I'll do another Q&A, like what will be a good subscriber marker to do the next one. If you have questions for the future, I also have my Q&A thread on my Patreon and Substack. So feel free to drop more questions on any video anytime and I'll try to answer them. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time. Bye.